So we have actually two kinds of a hybrid um, people, if you want to call them people. They're not really all people. We have ones who are true humans created in the image of God, and we are Elohim. Jesus says, you are Elohim. The sons of God, all of you, that we are spirit beings who have dominion, who are actually right now in an earth suit, in a body made of dust. We do not have the ability to be able to trace our genealogy back to Adam. God knows who, who real people are and who the non-real people are. And the important thing, though, is that in, the, in Bible days, that the Messiah be able to trace his genealogy all the way back to Adam so that his genealogy goes back to God as being a, a true son of God. Well, the very first time we see the word book, it is a reference to the book of life, the book of the generations of Adam or of mankind. And that's in Genesis 5. We'll just look at verses 1 through 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam, or you could just read man because it's the same word. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. So when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The thing that's important here to understand is that Adam was made in the image of God and he became uh, someone who with his wife Eve could produce other image bearers. But there was something about Adam's image that had changed when Adam fell. And that is that this fallen aspect would also be part of his descendants after. And this is why, even though Jesus can tr trace his genealogy all the way back to Adam, the fallen aspect was not traced through women. It was traced through men. The sin part of the genetic code is actually connected with the father, not the mother. So just a little note there. Verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So there was a new uh, son that would be the progenitor now of this of the messiah eventually and the days of adam after he fathered seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters thus all the days that adam lived were 930 years and he died there's more to that genealogy but you can read it yourself in in uh, genesis 5. Jesus genealogy traces his ancestry back to adam and this is in the gospel of luke and I'm not going to read the whole genealogy, but Luke 3, uh, verses uh, 23, and then 36 to 38. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, and then we're going to skip a bunch and go all the way back to Shem, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Okay. Jesus can trace his genealogy all the way back to Adam. Now, remember in Genesis 6, when we see the sons of God going into the daughters of men and trying to, through the seed of the woman, produce something of their own, they have no genealogy.
So when it came to uh, genealogies, the Jews were very particular about them. And it, especially when it came to both the priestly line, like through Aaron and the Levites and so on, when it came to the royal line through the tribe of Judah, and everybody being able to trace their lineage back through one of the 12 sons of Israel, of Jacob, and thus back through Abraham and, you know, through Shem, all the way back to um, Adam. Okay, this, this is important. This was important. And it, and it's important to us, too, to know this. Genealogies are important. We don't need to know ours, though. I just want to emphasize that. A lot of this 23andMe and Ancestry.com stuff is, you know, it's fun to find out what your ancestry is. But we don't have the ability nor the necessity to be able to know who is a true person and who isn't. God knows, and that's the important thing. So we know that the Messiah was promised to be, to be born of the seed of the woman. We know when the Messiah would come. That's what uh, the prophecy in Daniel 9 is all about. Verse 25 gives us the timing for this. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks and then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, and it, but in a troubled time. Seven weeks of years plus 62 weeks of years is uh, 483 Shemitahs from the decree of Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem. This is after the Babylonian captivity. And bring us to the year 27 AD. And that is when Christ appeared in the fall when the sabbatical years began and everybody was expecting him they were expecting Jesus to come and that's why when John the Baptist showed up they asked him if he was the Messiah and he say, stated that he was basically the forerunner he came in the um, spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord so Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the 70th sabbatical during the fall feast days, 483 years after the decree was issued exactly when he was expected to arrive. Now the Daniel 9 prophecy also states that the Jews would reject Jesus, the Messiah, when he came. Daniel 9, 26, A. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And Jesus talked about this too in Matthew 23, 37 through 39. And 24, 2. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you that you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he said to his disciples, do you see all these things? Uh, talking about the temple. He replied, truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And that, of course, happened in 70 AD. Now, here's what happened. When the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah, Israel's spiritual inheritance was transferred from them, from Israel, to another group of sons, and that is to believers. And this is what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 21, verses 43 through 46. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they knew that Jesus was speaking about them. And although they wanted to arrest him, they were afraid of the crowds because the people regarded him as a prophet. So the kingdom was going to be taken away from the nation of Israel and the scribes and Pharisees and the priests of Jesus' day and given to another nation who would produce fruits. That other nation was believers. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you, speaking of Christians, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation 1, 6. And he has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion to the ages of the ages. Amen. And Galatians 6, 15 and 16. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who walk by this rule, even to the Israel of God. Now, here is the other part of this. Even though the spiritual promises made to Israel were transferred to believers, the promises that God made to Abraham relating to an earthly kingdom remain intact for the sake of the patriarchs. That means that there is going to be a literal earthly nation of Israel, of descendants of Abraham, who will have earthly dominion. Romans 11 verses 1, 28, and 29. I ask then, did God reject his people? Certainly not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, he's going to speak about Israel. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies on your account. But regarding election, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. So, the rejection of the Messiah opened the way for believers to be part of this Israel of God. But God still has a plan for the actual physical descendants of Abraham. So this is a two-tiered kingdom where there's a spiritual Israel and there is going to be a literal Israel. Now, here's the deal. The current divine council, okay, talking about the Elohim, the sons of God, consisting of both holy and fallen heavenly sons of God, will one day be replaced by believers. Paul referred to those beings, the current council members, who are some of which are fallen, and uh, sons of God who have principalities and um, you know are over territories and so on. He referred to these beings that exist as having dominion. Verse 15, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So later when I do a video on death, I'm going to show you how Christ triumphed over these elemental spirits or these powers and authorities, these ancient beings who had authority over dominions and so on, and how through death Christ was able to triumph over them. So God's eternal plan is that the church will one day rule over principalities and powers. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. God's purpose was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as believers we know uh, we're going to replace those spiritual powers and authorities, those who are currently a little bit over us in the hierarchy. We're actually going to replace them. They know that. And the battle now is not, it's not a flesh and blood battle. This is a spiritual battle. And you and I are spiritual beings living in an earth suit and we're battling principalities and powers. Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So when Paul talked about the elemental spirits, it may be a reference to the Elohim, the sons of God of the Old Testament, the ones who make up the divine council, some of whom were assigned to the nations as gods. The Elohim are over the thrones and dominions. They're the rulers and authorities, which will one day be replaced by the new Elohim, glorified believers. 
So we're going to look at some passages here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 5 through 14. It's kind of long, but I want you to understand what your, what your destiny is as a believer. For it's not to angels that he subjected the world to come. Okay, there it kind of is in sort of black and white. It's not to angels, and it's not to the sons of God. It's not to the old rulers and principalities. It's not to angels that he subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But somewhere it is testified in these words, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. And from Psalm uh, 8, 5, that's Elohim. And you crowned him with glory and honor and placed everything under his feet. When God subjected all things to him, he left nothing outside of his control. That is Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting for God, for whom and through him all things exist, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both the one who sanctifies, that is Christ, and those who are sanctified, that's us, are of the same family, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will sing your praises in the assembly. And again, I will put my trust in him. And once again, here am I and the children God has given me. God's inheritance according to the flesh belongs to Israel. The actual physical descendants of Abraham. But his spiritual inheritance is us, <laughs> believers. And when the chief priests and scribes and elders rejected Christ, God chose new sons who by faith would be conformed to the image of Christ to act as God's new divine counsel. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. For he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his presence. In love, he predestined us for adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the beloved one. And Revelation 4, verse 4 and 5, verses 9 and 10. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. So it would seem that not only will believers replace the current divine council consisting of the angelic sons of God, but we will also rule on earth during the millennium, effectively replacing the gods, the former gods, the watcher angels, the sons of God, who are placed over the nations as recorded in Deuteronomy. One day believers will judge the angels, the Elohim some of whose roles we will be assuming as members of the divine council. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Do you not know that saints will judge the world? And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more things of this life? Okay, so now we're going to sort of branch out into another area. And this has to do with rewards and this life being a training ground for the future. So Christ wants trained believers to be future rulers with him 
in during the millennium and into eternity. And God trains us through the agency of the Holy Spirit who works inside of us individually. And he works through the assembly of believers, commonly called the church. And he has provided gifted people to the assembly to help with this training. And he has given each individual believer gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit to aid in the perfection and edification of the body. And the goal for all of this right now during this life is maturity in Christ. God wants us to be mature. Christ wants us to be mature. Colossians 1.28 We proclaim him, that is Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's the goal for every believer is to be mature in Christ. Now we get to the place where I want to talk about rewards. So the Bible talks about believers receiving rewards according to their faithfulness. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, this has to do with the things that we do after we've been born again, after we've become a Christian. We're not going to be judged according to the sinful stuff. Okay, that sin, the sin problem is already taken care of. Okay, we're not going to be judged when it comes to sin. The judgment now has to do with faithfulness. And it has to do with whether or not we were in good faith living for Christ as, as best we knew how with the enablement and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's not like we have to do this on our own. We don't and we shouldn't. We're supposed to be following after the Holy Spirit, being led by him. Now, most of us tend to view rewards as something we can hold in our hand, like we like we get an award or we're getting a crown or there's some kind of gift or there's some kind of um, we get more stuff in heaven. <laughs> you know, we get a bigger crown or a better crown or something, some kind of something that that's it, it seems like like it's stuff. But the way we're meant to think of this is actually that we are being given a higher status. We're be, being given a higher position. We're not talking about stuff. We're talking about position. When we receive our rewards, our, re our rewards are all about authority and dominion and how much authority and how much dominion we're going to be carrying in, you know, in the, ne in the next stage of this, okay, during the millennium and even afterward. And we understand this really from the parables of the servants in, you know, the parables in Luke and in, in Matthew, where it talks about servants who serve faithfully and servants who don't serve faithfully. Like one of the best ones is in Luke 19, where we have the, the servants who are given a certain amount of money that they're supposed to invest and, um, you know, one ten and one five and one servant gets uh, just uh, one mina. And when the time comes where they have to give an account Okay, which is what the Bema seat is about. It's about us giving an account for our lives, what we've done. Then uh, the master rewarded the servants according to their faithfulness. So the first servant said, your mina has produced uh, 10 more. And the master said, well done. You've been faithful in a very small matter. You will have authority over 10 cities. We're talking going from Mina to 10 cities. The second servant came forward and said, Master, your Mina has made five Minas. Okay, Mina is a unit of money. And he said to this one, you'll have authority over five cities. Faithful in a little put you over much, right? The faithful servants were given positions of responsibility and authority, not stuff. They were given a place, a position of honor and responsibility. However, wicked and unfaithful servants 
are going to be removed from service completely. Luke 19, 20 through 26. Then another servant came and said, Master, here is your mina, which I have laid away in a piece of cloth. For I was afraid of you because you are a harsh man. You withdraw what you didn't deposit and you reap what you didn't sow. And his master replied, you wicked servant, I will judge you by your own words. So you know I'm a harsh man, withdrawing what I didn't deposit and reap what I didn't sow. Why then did you not deposit my money in the bank? And upon my return, I could have collected it with interest. Then he told those standing by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten. And master, they said, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you that everyone who has will be given more, but the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now this is, uh, Jesus is using a parable to tell the story of this. And then the story is basically that, look, you're given something, something, and it's small. What you're given is small. It's not big. Most of us are given very small stewardships, our home, our family, our job, our children, taking care of our car, you know, being a good steward over the possessions, being a good, um, you know, friend to our friends, being, you know, basically anything we're given, we do the best that we can with what we have. We try to live as faithfully as possible. We're, we're not going to do it perfectly, but the idea is that is that we actually try. So the wicked servant knew that his master, you know, was collecting interest on things that he, you know, he didn't making money on, you know, on his money. And even though he said that, he didn't even bother to take the money and invest it and put it in the bank so it could have gotten some of that interest. The guy was was a cheat. Okay? He, and it's not like he wasn't a real Christian. It's just that, you know, he's like he didn't even bother. He didn't even try. He didn't even try. And his belief about his master was, was, was really wrong. It's obvious that the master was an extremely generous man. Extremely generous. And for the master, it wasn't about, did you do everything right? Did you not make any mistakes in your investments? You know, I want to see all the paperwork for this. No, it's that the guy was trying. Maybe his minus could have produced a hundred minus, but it didn't. It produced 10. Faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. It's about faithfulness after you're saved, not the sins you commit. And it's also about your attitude toward God and your attitude toward Christ and the, and the Spirit. Are you viewing them as being taskmasters who are mean and who are going to um, take things that don't belong to them? Or do you view God as, as being just, uh, kind, and being um, fair, and actually generous, overly generous? And that's, that's how we're meant to see the Lord. Now, I want you to understand that we're not being given stuff. We're be get, being given responsibilities. The Bema seat is where... Uh, responsibilities and authority are meted out. So basically, the, the Bema seat is the reward. And if you're given more responsibility, your crown, okay, having the crown and being ushered into the throne room of God is where the Bema seat takes place for you. You're be, being given your position. So we see this in the story of Joseph, for example, in uh, the book of Genesis, when he, you know, had been sold into slavery and you know, he's in the prison and he's hearing people's dreams and interpreting them and um, nobody remembers him. <laughs> and eventually uh, Pharaoh has a couple of dreams and they send for Joseph. He comes out of the prison. He tells the dream. And immediately he gets a gold chain around his neck and he is made second in command. And all the accoutrements that go with having authority, a signet ring, the golden chain, whatever, uh, riding in the chariot, all, all of those things are given to him because it indicates position. That immediately he was given all the, 
the uh, accoutrements of position, of a higher position. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being given a position and not stuff. It's not like, am I going to be living in a bigger mansion and having having a fancier food at the marriage supper of the Lamb or something like that. It's about what is your position in the coming kingdom. Revelation uses the word place when talking about position. The way we would think about having a position it, it uses the word place. Revelation 2 5, this is in the letter to the, uh, the, the church, I believe, of Ephesus. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So the lampstand was in a position of potential authority. And if these people do not overcome, they don't, you know, follow the dictates that are in this letter, they're going to be removed from their place or from their position. That word place is the Greek word topos, uh, uh, Strong's number 5117, and it, it carries with it both literal and metaphorical meanings. It can be an actual place. It can be a region or a seat. It can be an opportunity. Metaphorically, it's the condition or station held by someone in any company or assembly. In 1 Corinthians 14, 16, it's the place of the unlearned, the position of the unlearned. In Acts 1, 25, when talking about Judas's being replaced by Matthias. It talks about him having a place in this ministry. That is a position that was going to be filled by Matthias. So during the last days after Satan and the fallen angels are kicked out of heaven, they will no longer have a place or position in heaven. It's not like heaven ran out of space for Satan and his angels to live there, but they no longer have a heavenly position. Revelation 12, 7 and 8. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. That is, they no longer will have a position. And by that time, Who's going to be in heaven? Well, it's the all the believers represented by the 24 elders, both living and dead, who've been resurrected and glorified. The 144,000 of Israel who overcome, however many that is, they are going to be in heaven as well. And all the fifth seal martyrs will have, of which there are millions and millions, will have died, be in heaven, and have already received their resurrection bodies. So all the positions that need to be fulfilled by Satan and his fallen angels, all those positions will be filled. Just like that. Now, there's some Old Testament types of position and authority, which also um, the idea of intimacy is involved in this as well. Uh, the higher position you have, the greater intimacy you have with the Lord. And I know that's something we all want. And anybody who desires to have it, that kind of intimacy with the Lord will have it. That desire is something that is going to drive you to be faithful. And you, your faithfulness will be rewarded. So we know that there are positions of honor higher positions and lower positions and this type is portrayed by birth order and the firstborn was the one who held the higher position in the family and when joseph was in egypt and he became second to pharaoh and his brothers came in and eventually uh you know because of the famine and eventually they had to bring benjamin they were all seated when it came time for lunch. And remember, they didn't know that Joseph knew who they were. But they were all seated before Joseph according to age, from the firstborn to the youngest. Okay, And the men looked at each other in astonishment because this is, they were looking at the hierarchy. 
that Joseph understood the hierarchical relationship within the family of who who is the boss of who. And when it came to Benjamin, he received, even though he was the youngest, he received five times what everybody else got. And this was sort of hinting back to, to Joseph, who was the firstborn of his favorite wife, who Jacob was going to make the heir, be made the heir. Jacob was going to make Joseph the heir. That's what the, the beautiful coat of many colors was all about. Reuben forfeited it. And the other sons, he just didn't have any, he couldn't see potential in them, particularly. Um, and so he made, was going to make Joseph his heir. Now, when Joseph was supposedly killed by wild animals, you know, he was sold into Egypt. That made Benjamin next, next in line, theoretically. And so when Benjamin was given five times what everybody else got, they're all, they're all looking at this and going, there's something going on here. <laughs> okay, everybody else is seated in order according to their age, but the, it looks like the birthright double portion, actually quintuple portion, is going to the youngest one, who would be the next in line after Joseph of the favorite wife. Anyway, it all, all gets really interesting, but the, the idea here is that of position. And uh, we know that position can be lost. You can have a birthright or have the uh, a position of being the chief of your tribe or whatever, the elder of the family, the most influential or most important person, but you can lose that. Just like Esau lost his birthright. He sold it, but he didn't care either. He didn't care, and that's why he was able to sell it. He didn't care. Reuben, who slept with his father's concubine, lost it through immorality and just general foolishness. That the birthright is yours, but it's how you view it and how you handle it that makes all the difference. Now, we know that David, King David, is also a, a type of Christ. And in 1 Chronicles 11, we read about David's mighty men. And David had basically an inner circle of three guys, uh, Jashabim, Eleazar, and Abishai. Okay, and we don't know much about these people, but they were his three best guys. And then he had a group of 30 men of valor, among who was Uriah, uh, whom was Uriah the Hittite, whom he like murdered. And so it's like, yeah, I don't know if I want to be one of David's inside group. But anyway, these were, these were his mighty men. These were his guys, his, his little group that worked with him, that were his, his good friends and his companions. Jesus also had um, a kind of a hierarchy within the um, apostles. Now Jesus did not encourage them to think that way. He he told you guys are he told them you guys need to practice uh, serving one another. This is this is how you, uh, you you ensure that you'll have a higher position because the first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus had a larger group of about seventy, and then he had a group of about forty. And then he had a group of 12, and within that group of 12, there were three, Peter, James, and John. And out of those three, John, the beloved disciple. Greater and greater intimacy. Um, and, and I know a lot of people go, well, why does Jesus or God play favorites? He doesn't play favorites. A lot of people think that God doesn't have any favorites. Well, God loves us all. He loves us all the same. But anyone who draws near to him, he's going to draw near to them. And God is looking for people who want to be close to him. So if you want to be close to him, he wants to be close to you. That's the thing. He's waiting for you to draw near to him. God is seeking worshipers. But he's seeking people who are seeking him. And, and now this is on you. The, the impetus and the onus is on you to draw near to him. He's already drawn near to you. And now it's time for you to draw near to him. So there's coming a day 
when Satan and all of his angels are going to be unemployed. You know, Christ is going to be the king and his believers are going to be underneath him. And all of this is going to take place once Satan is cast out of heaven. Revelation 12, 9 and 10. And the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, he who accuses them day and night before our God. So all the places formerly occupied by fallen angels, the fallen Elohim, will be taken up by believers. And some of this may include believers assuming the role of the the uh, principalities or territorial angels, the watchers, uh, replacing the sons of God who are assigned to the nations. Okay, I want to go back to Israel now, the, the nation of Israel and God's plan for them. Because that's, that's sort of one of those untold stories about what's going to happen to them during the millennium and after. How are God's promises that he made to the patriarchs going to be fulfilled in eternity? Okay, and in the age to come. Well, from a human perspective, it would seem that the church has replaced Israel as God's sons. Okay, as the new kingdom of priests who are being given spiritual authority. However, there is indication, actually all kinds of it, all kinds of scriptures that tell us that during the last days, God is going to restore Israel's sonship. And that eventually the position that we hold or that we will hold as sons will probably, most likely, the Bible hints at this, will be held by Israel as the new sons of God. And this will happen as we, sort of the interim sons of God, become the bride of Christ. And this is going to happen after the millennium, after the great white throne judgment. So here's what the Bible tells us in Revelation 21. And then I'm going to give you uh, some Old Testament prophecies that where we can see how this is actually prophesied in the Bible. In Revelation 21 verses 5 through 7, this is actually in the context of the great white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation 20. All of this is one, one story. And then the one seated on the throne, that is the great white throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are faithful and true. And he told me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give freely from the spring of the water of life. The one who overcomes will inherit all things. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Who is, who is being talked about here? Well, the one who is being talked about here are actually those who overcome during the millennium. Uh, this judgment is not for believers, okay? So it's not talking about us. This judgment is talking about people who overcome during the millennium. The ones who overcome will inherit all things. I will be his God and he will be my son. Here's something that I want to talk to you about. Though Israel as a nation was rebellious from its inception, once the millennium begins, Israel will remain true to the Lord forever. Even in the face of the final Gog, Magog, Satanic rebellion at the end of the millennium. Okay, I'm going to read about that final rebellion. And then I'm going to read the prophecies that tell us that Israel, once the millennium begins, will never be rebellious against the Lord ever, ever again. Revelation 20, 7 through 9. When the thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison 
and go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to assemble them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the seashore, and they marched across the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Okay, that is Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Satan is going to gather a bunch of people, nations, many, many, many people. And usually when we're talking about the nations, we're talking about Gentiles. He's going to gather them together. And they're going to march on Jerusalem. They're going to march on Israel. The camp of the saints and the beloved city. The camp of the saints, I believe that's where glorified believers are. That's our temporary home because our real home is in heaven, in the New Jerusalem. It's the temporary place when we're on earth ministering, the camp of the saints. It's the little outpost here. <laughs> and the beloved city. They're going to surround Israel, Jerusalem, where the nation of Israel is with Christ as their king. Here's the Old Testament prophecies that talk about this. Hosea 1, 10 and 11. Yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. And it will happen that in that very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And that's what we read about in in Revelation 21. I will be his God and he will be my son and he will inherit all things. Then the people of Judah and of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and will go up out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Isaiah 45 17. But Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or humiliated to ages everlasting. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to stop their transgression, to bring in everlasting righteousness. So this is about the 70 weeks of Daniel. At the end of the 70th week, Israel, the nation of Israel, will never again rebel against the Lord. This is all designed to stop the rebellion of the Jews. So during the millennium, they are not going to rebel against the Lord. They'll never do that again. That all of this was meant to stop the rebellion. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and inscribe it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. This rebellion is going to stop. It will stop at the second coming of Christ and Israel will never rebel again. In fact, when Satan is released at the end, he's going to gather nations together to come against Israel, come against the beloved city. And who's the city beloved to? It's beloved to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. So it's at that time when... Um, when God has a new group of sons who do not rebel against him, that they will inherit all things. And I believe that they will replace now us who've been holding their position temporarily. And we then will go on to be the bride. We will become the wife of the lamb. It's a different position. It's a new position now that we will hold. Uh, Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. And let it, the one who is thirsty come. And the one who desires the water of life drink freely. This is the invitation, by the way. This is the invitation that Revelation 19 talks about. This is the the spirit and the bride say, come, but they're not inviting anybody to this marriage supper until after the great white throne judgment. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She was given clothing of fine linen, bright and pure, 
for the fine linen she wears is the righteous acts of the saints. So we're going to be rewarded uh, for the things that we do during the millennium. As believers living in a glorified state, we're going to receive additional rewards. And this glorification, we're going to go from glory to glory. Okay, this is <laughs> it's going to go from good to better to best. Then the angel told me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Now, this is where it gets really, really mind-blowing. And if you're still here, if you've hung in there with me this long, this is where things get incredible. If we go back to Genesis, Genesis 2, uh, 22 through 24, this is where we have the creation of the woman, the original bride, by the way. This is the type for the bride, is the creation of the woman from the man in the garden. And from the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her to him, just like we're going to be presented to Christ. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for out of man she was taken. Okay, and remember the church is hidden, has been hidden in Christ in this um, spiritual way, um, hidden in Christ since before the foundation of the world. We have always existed in this very small form inside of Christ. Verse 24, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that crawls on the earth. Okay, this is, this is an allegory, a symbol, a type. That in eternity, the lamb and the bride, the wife of the lamb, are going to expand on creation. There is a prophesied future, be fruitful and multiply aspect that in partnership, Christ with us in partnership together are going to expand the universe and beyond. And this is something that our finite minds cannot really grasp. But we see it here in seed form. That the partnership of the, of the lamb and the bride is going to be fruitful. It's going to multiply. It's going to fill. And there's there's more <laughs> there is much more that's out there for us that's that's beyond our comprehension or grasp and in the process of all of this the fallen ones are going to be dethroned all of them and defeated and in eternal punishment and the righteous are going to shine like the sun forever and ever and the story is only going to ever always, always get bigger and bigger. Always. The story only gets bigger. So in the end, even the nation of Israel who rejected Christ, who forfeited their position basically to us, and then we become placeholders as the um, sons of God who replace the uh, the fallen ones, not all of them are fallen, but a lot of them are. And their positions are going to be uh, removed from them. And they're going to be put in other places. <laughs> the fallen ones are going to be put in the lake of fire. And we are going to be the replacement sons. Replacement sons of God. Holding those positions 
until the end of the millennium when God's faithful Israel will become the sons of God who replace us as we go on to be the bride of Christ. Isn't that a great story? Isn't that a wonderful story? I, you know, when, when all of this started connecting for me, I was like, you know, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. And in, a, in an upcoming video, I want to talk about how death is the key to all of it. God worked death in, and death became the way that all of this was achieved. All right, so I hope you'll uh, leave a comment in the comment section. I hope you'll share this video. And uh, till the next video, I pray you have a very, very blessed day.